Dr. Anna Saylor with Van Every Family Chiropractic Center. We just kind of wanted to share a little bit about us. I'm a wife and I'm a mother of two beautiful girls. I went to Michigan State. Um, I have my degree in from Parker Chiropractic and I've been practicing for 17 years. So I've been in Royal Oak at Van Every for 17 years. I have a diploma in pediatrics, which means I have an additional three year degree working with kids. So when we actually say we specialize, we do specialize with children. Um, I, there's a couple of my wonderful awards. I was World Oak Volunteer of the Year, Citizen of the Year, um, a, a Athena nominee, and we have been the top chiropractor since 2012, Metro Parents top docs since 2013, and so we're really good at what we do, too. All right, um, and I am Dr. Ashley Taggart. Um, I am a soon-to-be wife and a number one auntie to a cute little boy. <laughs> um, I went to Life University. Uh, I did my undergrad work at Wayne State here. Um, and then I traveled down to Georgia to go to school. Um, I graduated in 2011. And while I was in school, I was also able to get extra certification in pediatrics. I have half of Dr. Saylor's degree, um, her diplomate. So <laughs> I'm working on completing the rest of it, but one step at a time. Um, and I am also Webster Technique certified, which is a specific technique for pregnant mothers. So, um, been in practice for five years, and uh, been really enjoying working with Dr. Saylor for the past year and a half. So, so this is our why. These are my beautiful daughters. This is Brighton and Brick. Um, I'll get emotional. Children are meant to be health, healthy and happy. My kids are the most beautiful kids, and I love them to death, obviously. Um, I had someone say a while ago, you're so lucky. And I came home from my, to my husband, I'm like, you know, someone told me how lucky we are and how, you know, they're so happy and they're so healthy. And he's like, it has nothing to do with luck. They're healthy by choice. They're not healthy by chance. They've been adjusted since birth, basically. You know, we eat organic. We do, we make choices every single day to keep them healthy and happy. So that's our saying here, it's healthy by choice. It's just not by chance. So. Right. And that's my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's been adjusted since he was three out. Well, I adjusted his first adjustment when it was, was when he was three hours old. So um, he's incredibly healthy and happy and obviously full of a lot of attitude. You can tell by his face. <laughs> so um, our goal with working with kids is our goal is to put things in uh, we want to add things to their life, not necessarily take things away. So it's not about you know chasing the symptoms and getting rid of them. It's about adding quality to their life. So that's really what our focus is in our office. Um, we have a mom here today that has first-hand experience. My name is Joanne Shango. Um, I'm an educator. Um, I've been teaching in Montessori schools for the past 25 years, and um, thought I had pretty good experience to raise children, um, and did with my first two. And then my third child, um, he was a little bit different. And um, turns out he had sensory processing disorder, um, and that was hard. We didn't quite get it because it kind of seemed like just behavioral, you know, is it just attitude? And he'd been adjusted with uh, Dr. Saylor since he was about eight months old. He'd had chronic ear infections, and she was growing to know him, and she was like, I think maybe it's behavioral, but there's something else, you know? And so we started doing um, uh, OT uh, for sensory processing, and it was pretty effective. Um, while we were doing that, I actually made a choice to not do the chiropractic because I wanted to just, you know, see what was OT doing. And about halfway through it, I urgently went back to Dr. Saylor and said, he really needs an adjustment. And it kind of helped even click the OT um, with uh, the chiropractic and was really helping him a lot. And so then he did really well for about a year. In his sensory <laughs> processing, he's really sensitive to sound, he's also sensitive to touch. Um, and it comes out in a very aggressive way that seemed very extreme and unnatural, particularly with sensory kids. Um, the touch that feels like this when somebody just brushes you by, um, it feels like somebody punched them, and so then they punch back. And yet nobody would see what happens. So it's completely, you know, instigated, you know, not instigated. He's just picking fights, and we just really didn't know what was happening. Um, and he was labeled. He didn't. <laughs> no, I'm going to get emotional. Um, his four-year-old year, he didn't get invited to any birthday parties outside of Brighton's. And it was so hard because he was at my school where I'm the principal. And I understood it. I understood why they weren't inviting him. But it was really, really hard. About uh, this time last year, he was doing better. And um, he came to me and he said that he, um, he wanted to go back to therapy. 
and I wasn't as consistent with the chiropractic. She's my neighbor. <laughs> we get there pretty often, but not as consistently as we had been. Um, and uh, so I called the doctor and I said, he's asking to go back to OT. And um, she said, then, you know, he knows his body, so listen to him. And we started going to OT and he started regressing, which is not normal for sensory process, you know, kids with SPD. Um, so then I had to ask the hard question. First of all, are they doing their job right? Like, what, what are you guys doing wrong? Like, are you making a mistake here with this therapy? And they said no. And if he's regressing, then maybe it's something else. And the signs were not pointing overall to him being autistic, but it would be the only explanation for a kid with SPD to go backwards. So I freaked out, went to Anna, and she was kind of feeling like, you know, maybe that was coming up, which really freaked me out. And the pediatrician said, well, let's do some, a few things. And she, you know, sent him to get allergy testing and all of this kind of stuff. And she wanted to have a neuropsych exam. And um, I was contemplating it. As an educator, I'm not big on labels. I'm a Montessori educator. We, we don't do labels <laughs> very well. And um, so I was kind of freaking out, and I backed off of it for a little bit because my gut was telling me, He's definitely sensory, but maybe not autistic. And it'd be okay, you know, he's, he's a great kid, but I wasn't feeling that was the right thing. We started diligently going to uh, Dr. Saylor, and um, the difference in my son is extraordinary. Um, she's so intuitive uh, with her adjustments, and um, she can adjust for emotional things, and she can adjust for physical things, and piecing it all together, and he walks into the office with her, and he's like at peace. It's like from eight months old, he'd walk in and she'd come over with this tool that should be like scary because it looks like a gun. And he's like, oh, and would get adjusted at eight months and feel at peace. And now at five and a half and feels at peace. He asks for adjustment before he can tell her where he wants to be adjusted. She's there and he's basically saying thank you, you know, to her. Um, he's a different kid. Today we were at gymnastics and a neighbor that hasn't seen him in over a year just looked at him and she doesn't know his story really, but she said, wow, he's a different kid. Um, and I said, yeah. And she's like, what's going on? And I said, uh, well, why do you think he's different? She's like, he's slower. And he was having a bad day today, just, just so you all know, because he still has those, you know? And he was having a rough day. And she was like, whoa, like huge difference with this kid, you know? Like, and I said, what? And she's like, he's making eye contact. I could actually hear all of his words, because he's always been able to talk. He, he started talking out of the womb. But he was always talking in fast forward, like faster than I'm talking right now, because I'm nervous. Um, and, um, I mean, she just pegged it. I mean, within 35 seconds of seeing him today, she's like, different kid, and this is the kid that a year ago, we thought maybe it's not just SPD, maybe it is autism, and regular chiropractic care. Um, she saved his life. Uh, he'd be a different kid. He'd be a kid without friends. He used to vocalize and say, oh, when he'd have his really rough days, he'd say, nobody likes me, I have no friends, I'm the worst person ever, and, um, he has friends and he's like, How, who's coming over to my house today? You know, can I have a sleepover? And this is a kid that we couldn't even contemplate that a year ago. Um, and he's been adjusted since birth, but since um, we really started pegging that this could be something that could really spin out of control, um, diligently two times a week, sometimes three times a week, um, she saved his life. He's an amazing kid that's top of his class now um, and believes he can do anything. And he has friends and it's really, really great. So there he is. <laughs> this is why we're sharing this story. Because we want you to hear the message too. And we are gonna be by the mic. Okay. <laughs> okay. We know that we've been traveling a road and we're actually in a place where we're the unhealthiest we've been, you know, in society in a long, long time. So what this says is we know what happens to people who stay in the middle of the road. They get run over, right? So the idea of what we're talking about today is how we need to shift our thinking from where we are to a new place. Because obviously what we're doing now is not working. <laughs> so if we've always done, if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we always got, right? Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> so. Okay, so a lot of people, you know all these stats. You've seen them, they've been shared. Um, and this is kind of, it's getting scarier and scarier because we are, like we, in a society that has so much wonderful medicine and just knowledge, how are we getting sicker? 
Like how are our kids getting sicker and how are we as a society getting unhealthier? So our job here is about gaining better awareness. We want you to be aware of things and we want to be able to give you answers and we want to give you action steps. So you're going to watch a video and there's two teams. There's a white team and a black team and you're going to count. We want to see if you are aware of how many times the white team passes the ball. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? So the whole point, yes, they turned it 13 times, but there was a guy in a moonwalking bear suit. And a lot of us missed it because it's really easy to miss something if you're not looking for it. Okay, so our goal tonight is to give you a plan. Um, gain better awareness. There's moonwalking bears throughout this whole, everywhere we look. Um, we want to give you answers and we want to give you action steps. So we want you to walk away with an idea of what else you can do. Two rules when we were growing up, right? Don't call kids names. <laughs> so I know a lot of times people want to get their kids, you know, focused with labels because then they can get care for them and get the insurance for them and all that stuff, but that's not what we do in our office. We want to focus on what's right and not give them labels, okay? And the other thing is don't do drugs, right? <laughs> so we know sometimes, you know, kids are on a ton of medications and our goal is to really get them to function without having to be reliant on those medications. So the question is, why is this called the perfect storm? It's the perfect storm because all these things we're gonna talk about come together and it's a lot of different things. We know it's not just one thing that's keeping kids sick. It's a numerous, a whole bunch of different things. And so our tagline is a perfect storm. And we talk about, we'll talk about three T's. Three T's, first one, chemical stress. Second T, physical stress, trauma. And third T is emotional stress, st thoughts. So let's start with physical stresses. Uh, you know, a lot of times parents look at their beautiful baby and say, how can anything be wrong with this kid, right? They come out and they're happy and they can't figure out where the problems are coming from. So the things that we start talking about are from very early on. Um, in utero constraint would be when the mom's pelvis is not where it needs to be for the birthing process. And when that happens, it puts a lot of strain on the baby as well, obviously. Um, when that happens also, a lot of times it leads to birth trauma because there has to be more intervention. Um, and a lot of times we don't think about this as, as physical traumas, but we really wanna focus on making sure that these things aren't happening and if they are, we're able to address them from an early age. Childhood falls. Obviously, we all learn how to walk and learn how to ride a bike and do all those things. All those things are traumas because we fall over and over again. And while we may be wearing a diaper, it doesn't stop the problem from happening. Um, and then also things like the back to sleep program where they tell you you have to put your kid on their back or they're going to suffocate or have SIDS happen or, you know, all those different things. Um, we just want to make sure that all these things aren't necessarily the best for the kid, right? And then also car seats, which are one of the worst things because unfortunately they're easy, right? We put the kid in them and we take them everywhere in their car seat. Um, think about what that does to the baby's spine, right? So they're sitting in a car seat for hours a day and it's not really the healthiest place for their spine. Um, and then also those other things like the baby wears and the bouncy chairs and all those different things put different stresses on the body. So um, all these things cause problems and cause stresses that are physical on their body. You know, this is America's Funniest Home Video, right? We've all seen them and we all laughed. Well, as pediatric chiropractors now, it's cringeworthy. And as a parent, it becomes cringeworthy. So let's just take a quick peek at traumas.
Right. So it is okay to laugh because it is America's Funniest Home Videos. Um, but, you know, we watch it from a different standpoint. So a lot of times we'll ask patients, like, oh, any traumas? No, no. And it's like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, maybe not. Okay. So we also talk about the second T, it's toxins. And toxins is chemical stress. Um, this is not only what you put in your body, but what you don't put in your body. So really quick, talking about preservatives, pesticides, processed foods, sugars, a lot of different environmental chemicals, um, antibiotics, vaccines, other drugs, anything that they're putting in these children, it can be a chemical toxin to their, their systems. So this I found fascinating. This is a study. It was published in 2005. So think about it 10 years later. Okay, this is, it's 10 years of much more stress, much more toxins, much more chemicals. In healthy umbilical cord blood, 287 chemicals in the umbilical cord blood. Think about that. This is, the baby hasn't even been born yet, or it just had been born, and it already has 287 chemicals detected, 180 that cause cancer in humans and animals. Do you think if they did this study now, it would be a little higher than this? Like when I read this, this scares me, to think this much before the baby's even born. And the last one that we talk about is thoughts or mental and emotional stressors. So we see these first two stressors um, a lot more in younger kids, but this one doesn't usually come around until they are in school because we see that they're having to manage making friends and manage classes and manage homework and all these different things. And as that happens, we start to see the emotional stresses pop out with the kids. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that it doesn't just impact the life of the kid when they start to have these emotional stressors. It starts to impact the teachers because they have to deal with it and the parents because they're trying to manage their kid when they're not with them. Um, and all the people that come into contact with the kid on a daily basis have to help manage the, the emotional stresses that come along with these thoughts or stresses. Things like pregnancies because they scare us a lot of times into doing things that we don't necessarily want to do. Um, emergency deliveries for reasons that they have to be delivered. Sometimes also planning things like cesarean sections. Um, it's just happening more and more. Um, longer NICU stays because kids are being born premature. And then we lived obviously fast paced, high stress lifestyles, which doesn't really help. And then obviously getting labeled and going to school and having to manage your label when you're trying to make friends um, can be really difficult for these kids, so. So everybody remember the three T's, right? Trauma, thoughts, and toxins. And that's the, the big thing where we talk about. So this is the perfect storm. So when you think back, if you have a child in mind that you've been thinking about, or children, or grandchildren, and you start looking at all the different things that we just talked about, all the different T's, all the different stressors. I mean, fear-based pregnancy, we talk about a lot because we look at society as a whole and they're scaring us. I've had two and they scare you. They scare you into doing things that maybe you don't wanna do. They scare you into thinking that you have to have a C-section. They, it's just more, much more about a stress. Birth intervention, we talk a lot about induction. So for me, if your body's not ready to have a baby and you get induced, think about what it's doing. You know, it takes a lot to get your body ready for a pregnancy. And induction, I think of it as a pile driver. So you think about what's going on with this baby, and that sounds awful, but that's kind of what happens. And then we have things that happen later. We have colic, which poor sleep. We have difficulty nursing. So a lot of times, how, my first question to a new mom is, does he go to one side of the breast, not the other? Because if he's going to one side of the breast and having difficulty nursing on the other side, it's usually something going on in the neck. Because we have two breasts for a reason. <coughs> Babies should go to both sides equally. Chronic ear infections. So all these things are the perfect storm. They just keep going. And by, I've been in practice for 17 years. And taking histories, this is what we are finding. This is what happens over and over and over again. I'm sorry about that. Um, but then we have chronic use of antibiotics, and then we have chronic vaccines, and then we have toxic food, and then video games, lots and lots of video games. And we're seeing not just video games, because all of you guys are guilty of it too, cell phones, texting, head forward posture. Okay, this doesn't feel good, and it's not getting better. We're seeing more and more kids with really, really bad posture. We're seeing more and more young kids, young teenagers with chronic arthritis in the neck already starting. 
You shouldn't have arthritis in your neck until you're 80. That's my philosophy. And we're seeing it in 20s. And this can lead to the perfect storm. So this talks about all the different things that when you start looking at it, it can lead to. All right, so what is chiropractic? You're probably wondering why we're here and what we're gonna do about it, right? <laughs> so uh, what our goal is, is to connect, obviously, perception and coordinate behavior. So you can see the function of the nervous system is to perceive the environment and coordinate the behavior of all other cells. Uh, so. It's more than just neck pain and back pain, headaches and all the stuff that we think of when you think of a chiropractor. And that's why we're here tonight, is to educate you about how we do a lot more than that. Okay, so our goal is to let you know that these diagnoses is, almost every one of them, if you think about them, it's a lack of perceiving the environment correctly and then coordinating what's going on, right? And then the body can't give a proper output. And that's really what all, at the very base of all of the things that we're talking about tonight, that's really what it's about. So our job is not to give you a bigger Band-Aid or some more medication you can take. Um, it's just to find what's going on and provide you with solutions that don't necessarily meet what you had up until now. One of the big things that we talk about, and this is as a chiropractor, is we talk about the word subluxation. And a subluxation for us is a minor misalignment of the spine. We don't think it's very minor, but that's kind of the definition. We think it's actually a pretty big deal. Um, and so we'll get kind of into the cause and effect. Um, the recipe for a perfect storm, the three T's, right? The results are, we, call, we talk about the four D's, which leads to the fifth D, which is disconnect. So, and these are big words, they're you know, million dollar words, and we'll go through each of them, but you have dyskinesia, disaffrontation, dysautonomia, dysponesis, that leads to disconnection. So, the ability to adapt to these three T's, it was what leads to the problems. Um, one of the things I say is, you know, you have, I give you, all hundred of you, a chili recipe. And I say, okay, here's the ingredients, here's a chili recipe, make chili. Are you all gonna do it exactly the same? Probably not. And that's kind of what we talk about when we talk about a spectrum. So they're not all the same. So even if someone has the ADHD label, they're not all the same. There's a hundred different versions of that, even though they're the same ingredients. And this is what we're trying to stress when people say, well, why my child, or why my grandson, or why them? We don't know because it's a whole bunch of things going on. We're also going to be talking about the inability to adapt, and that's really, adaptation is the biggest thing that chiropractic focuses on, and making sure your body can adapt properly, right? So um, <clears throat> I'm going to use fever as an example of this. So if you are camping and you need to drink some water from the stream, what are you going to do to it first? Boil it, right, boil it. And why do you boil it? kill the bacteria, right? Yep. So just like with a fever in our bodies, when we have bacteria in there and our body spikes a fever, everyone in mainstream says, get rid of the fever, then it'll get rid of the problem. But the fever's there for a reason, because just like boiling the water, your body needs to boil the bacteria to kill it so that you can get better. And that's really what happens. And that's just an example of adaptation. Dyskinesia is the first one we're gonna talk about. And characteristically, this is what you think of when you think of chiropractic. Misalignment becomes fixated, chiropractor goes in there, puts it back where it goes, and you go on with your day. Obviously, this is important. We need to make sure we have an, a range of motion that allows us to move the way we're supposed to. Movement is inherent to the spine's function. So we need to be able to move. That's how the spine gets its nutrients. So it's very, very important. We need to make sure it's moving properly so that the nutrients is spread throughout the body, okay? So what we see is obviously things like being crooked and kinked. That's not what we want, okay? So we start here. We wanna make sure that we can fix these problems, but if we don't fix them, things continue along the way. So I have a prop here. And no, this is not a real baby. <laughs> Even though Drake, his name is Drake. This is my daughter's. Um, baby, and I did promise to after I show him, show you guys what we do to him, that I will adjust him later. So do not, no baby's harmed, right? <laughs> um, so he's a beautiful baby, and people are always like, well, how does it start? You know, first of all, we did talk about the in utero constraint. You know, one of the big things, like, you know, if a baby's always on one side or they're stuck over here, we hear it a lot. Mom's like, oh, he's over here all the time. Well, that's a key thing to in utero constraint. If the baby's in one position, it doesn't want to get where it should be. A baby should float and be wonderful. So how do you think the first subluxation starts? How about birth? 
the birthing process. So, and there's a lot of different ways to birth babies. Um, this one is gonna show you a normal C-section. So if you're a little squeamish, close your eyes. It's only a couple seconds. Um, but it actually is gonna show you a vacuum extraction C-section. And I just wanna watch, have you watch what they're doing to the head and neck. Okay, so there's a reason why they don't let you videotape C-sections, right? This is a little peek behind the blue curtain. So if I were to give you this baby, brand new baby, what's the first thing I want to say? Cradle his head. Hold his head. Cradle his neck. Versus if I were to do this. <laughs> I've watched a video where it's natural, and this is not just C-sections. I've watched a natural delivery. Doctor had his foot up on the table, pulling on the neck, and popping the hip, doing whatever it takes. Okay, so can now think, where do you think the first subluxation would come from? Yeah, and this is a planned C-section. Imagine if it was an emergency C-section. Imagine the difference, okay? So this is kind of the stats with C-sections, and we were going to, I looked up Oakland County's rates for Beaumont, and they don't disclose their C-section rates. And that was on two different reports I looked up, and they have no disclosure. But they, do, they are saying that their C-section rates are going down. I don't know who I believe. Um, but if you look at this, so we have C-section rates that are going up, up, and up. And we have more stress, and we have more toxins, and we have more issues. Do you think there's a reason why our kids are so sick? Okay. So this, this right here is the moonwalking bear. This is the awareness. No one thinks about it. Because what happens after a C-section? They wash the baby, they weigh the baby, and you go home with the baby. Do you think anyone ever says, hey, I bet they should probably, you know, I really pull on his neck. I bet, you know, you probably should have that neck looked at. No, they're not. Pretty graphic, I know. Part, I promised I would adjust Drake later. I promised. <laughs> <laughs> so this study talks about, um, and you have this in your notes, and I found this fascinating because this was, they studied 100 100 healthy babies after birth. And it's not a chiropractic study, it's a DO study. 100 healthy babies, so imagine if they were not healthy. 99 of them were subluxated. Automatically from the top, 99. And you can read through here, and then they, 99 in the upper, and then they go through different, 90% of different areas of their bodies were subluxated. And this is healthy babies. You can't get much more than 99 if they were unhealthy. It's, you know it's gonna be 100%, right? Okay, so this is one of the things that we want you to take away from it. This is what we look at. So birth in an injury and um, how it impacts things. And what this is saying is, the biggest thing for us is we want to see how things can be changed, right? And most of the time when you hear about things like autism, they tell you that it's all genetic and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but the research is starting to say that it's also about epigenetics, which is the environment that the body is in. So it's not just about genetics, it's about how your body is perceiving its environment and how that can impact things. So it's, like I said, the ingredients are just as important as what's going on from a genetic perspective. So epigenetics, it's a really big field right now. <laughs> um, everyone is starting to look at, instead of just the only thing that will ever impact what's going on in your body being from your parents genetic wise. The things that we are exposed to on a daily basis, the decisions we make about our lifestyle, all of these things are having a huge impact. So using the deck of cards analogy, um, a lot of times these kids are born with a stacked deck, okay? Which is really unfortunate. So these lifestyle choices are just as important if not more important with these kids. So we need to make sure that we're taking the most precautions when it comes to the things they're exposed to on a daily basis. Um, interestingly enough, um, Dr. Saylor and myself and Danelle were at a autism talk over well, last Friday, and Dr. Herbert, who is actually uh, an MD, she works at MassGen, 
Massachusetts General Hospital, and she's also a researcher at Harvard. Um, a lot of the research she's coming out with now is showing how important this topic is, and it's starting to come out in mainstream. So it's really awesome to see it coming from the other side of the fence, and so we can see that things can be done to change what's going on. It's not just about what you're born with, you have to live with, okay? So um, these birth traumas that are causing these motion dysfunctions, like we're talking about with dyskinesia, <laughs> leads on to disafferentation. So <clears throat> this is where we're gonna s switch from the physical component to things being more neurological, okay? So we wanna drive home the fact that there's actually seven senses. Um, the ones you normally think about, and then the motion senses, which are our movement and our balance and coordination. And these are very, very important. Um, this is how your body tells you what's going on, okay? That's what proprioception and nociception are. So nociception is the bad stimuli. Proprioception is the good stimuli, and we want to make sure that they're working the right way. So this is just a short video about, um, and it makes really a lot of sense about the brain. Some kids are really bouncy and can't sit still. Some kids aren't very coordinated. Some see food as a pile of toxic goo that hurts their mouth and jangles their taste buds. School might be a mysterious place where things don't make much sense. If this sounds like you, you may have sensory processing disorder, and we're going to explain it here. Your body has seven senses. Vision in your eyes, hearing in your ears, touch in your skin, taste in your mouth and smell in your nose. And you have two movement senses, your muscles and your sense of balance. In sensory processing disorder, these senses don't communicate right with your brain. Think of the nerves connecting your brain and senses as a set of roads. Those roads should be smooth superhighways so that the senses and brain can communicate fast. If you have sensory processing disorder, then some of your roads are bumpy and rough. You can also think of the senses as having a broken volume control. If the volume is too high, you will feel your senses too strongly. If the volume is too low, you won't feel sensation at all. In fact, you'll want more. Some kids overcome these problems as they grow older. Others need help. So we just wanted to show you how we talk about volume, but how the nervous system plays a part with the brain on this one. All right, so when we have a, any kind of pr loss in proper motion or alignment, it causes a decrease in proprioception, which is our perception of motion, and then an e increase in nociception, which is the noxious or bad stimulus. Um, when those two things combine, we end up in something called sympathetic overdrive. Okay, so we're talking about communication is jammed. So look at this, basically, between his thumb and his, ring, and his index finger, all subluxations start there, okay? My big thing is, any idea why a lot of the subluxations that we see with newborn babies are on the right side? Any clue? because at most, 90% of the doctors are right-handed. So think about delivery process. Your right hand is your dominant hand. Your left hand is your guide hand, whether it's a C-section or a natural delivery. So take the baby with the right, pull. What do you think it's doing to the right side of the neck? It's jamming the right side of the neck. <coughs> Where, look at, he's right-handed. You can tell it's right-handed dominant, and it's all right under that, right under here. Proprioception is the movement of the spine. 60% of proprioception comes from the spine itself. One third of it's in the upper part of the neck. So upper part of the neck. Second is in the sacrum. Any clue where the third part of it would come from? We will give you a hint, how about this? I want to have you watch this video and see if you can figure out where the third biggest, largest proprioception. Now watch it in slow motion. First of all, you see what she's doing with her neck? Yeah. Okay. And then she's got her wrist and her elbows. It's actually beautiful. 
in slow motion. I was amazed how beautiful it looked. What do you think she's doing? She's stimming, but what do you think she's actually trying to do? And she's trying to increase proprioception. Proprioception is the good stuff. She's trying to get more good stuff to her brain. And it's almost all wrist, ankles, elbows. But it was really interesting. I found that fascinating because that chiropractically, I just wanted to get my hands on her. I'll admit it. I just wanted to like message them and say, please. Subluxation, which when you hear subluxation, you think stress. You should also think sympathetic. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this handout now. So we have misalignment. It leads to fixation. Fixation means our stress is stuck on. So if you guys want to get your little sheets out, you can see them a little bit easier. Uh, what this is showing us is how most of these kids are stuck in sympathetic overdrive, which means their gas pedal is stuck on. They're not even conscious that the brake is there. It's not working. So what happens when we see this is these kids have this cycle that they stay in and they continue to get worse and worse. It turns into a vicious cycle. So what we want to do is teach them how to pump the brake because obviously we don't want them to slam on the brakes. That would be just as detrimental to their health as having their sympathetic system stuck on. So gas pedal, think about it like fight or flight. You're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. You're not going to stop to go to the bathroom or eat a steak, right? Um, that's really one of the focuses. So we want to make sure that their body is able to do both of the things. When we see parasympathetic system, it is your rest and digest system. So. These two things can't happen at the same time. Like it says in there, you can't be in growth and protection at the same time. So we need these kids to have their bodies work more effectively to not only use the gas, but also use the brake. And you can see in there, those thoughts, traumas, and toxins over time start to add up. And that's why we get stuck on this red side over here where we're gas pedal to the floor, cruising through traffic, hitting stuff. The gas is on all the time. So that's what we really want to focus on is how these kids are stuck in a sympathetic overdrive and how we can get them out of it. And it's not just the kids. Right. I was going to say. In that. reality. It's, we see our youngest, my youngest patient is three minutes old. My oldest is 103. We see it across the board. You guys are, as you're sitting here, you're probably thinking, yeah, I'm a little stuck in overdrive. I'm a little sympathetic. I got the gas pedal going 90 miles an hour. All right. So gate theory just talks about how, think about it like two rivers. When we have one river, that's the Nile, and the other is the Clinton River, right? Which one is going to be the one that's dominant when they're trying to come together, right? The Nile. So when we have this increased nociception, which would be the bad stuff, the noise, or um, like Metallica pretty much playing all the time, we don't have the proper amount of proprioception, which stems from dyskinesia or that improper motion. Most of us don't want to have to hear this all the time, right? This is where these kids are stuck, okay? Not so pleasant. There's a reason why they don't play that at an elevator. Right? <laughs> Instead, we get to listen to this on the elevator, right? This is a normal elevator music. It's calm, it's relaxing. This is not where they live. They live in that, like, ah. What happens, dyskinesia, disafferentation, we lead to dysautonomia. So this is when our autonomic nervous system is not functioning right. So your autonomic nervous system controls every possible thing you can think of, okay? Um, every cell, every tissue, every organ in your body is controlled by this. So when we have imbalance there, it leads to problems in the major systems, okay? So you can see on the sheet that looks like that, which is at the back of your folder, we have A, which would be the spine, impacts B, which would be the organs, the glands, all of those different things and in the very end leads to the things we see in C. We see ear infections, um, digestive system. A lot of times you'll know that these kids are on very restricted diets. And the endocrine system, that is what lets out all of our hormones. So hormonally speaking, if they're in sympathetic overdrive, they're on like cortisol, which is your stress hormone, is being released constantly into their body which is unfortunate and leads to a lot of other things. So think about it like a light bulb. When you get home at night and you see that you walk up to the porch, the lights are out. You go inside, all the lights are still out. 
you're not gonna go and get a bunch of light bulbs and replace all the light bulbs, right? You're gonna go to the breaker box and fix the breaker. And it's the same idea with chiropractic. We wanna fix the breaker so that the lights will work. So you can go, and I'll just jump in, but with the breaker, you can go in the dark and feel down with your, your eyes closed in the dark, right? You would know which breaker is flipped, and you would flip it back. Why do you think the breaker flipped? Maybe stress somewhere, overload somewhere in the house? And what is the breaker doing? It's basically protecting your house so it doesn't burn down, right? So you can flip it back if you're not taking care of the stressor or something that's plugged in, the 8,000 things that are plugged in, it's gonna flip again, and it's gonna flip again, and it's gonna flip again, and again, and again. So when someone says, well, why do you have to keep going to a chiropractor? I'm like, really? And I'm like, Stop flipping the switch. All right, so this stress is a vicious cycle. Um, we always say nerves that fire together wire together. So that's really important for us. Um, and so this stress cycle, so we have a stimulus from the nervous system, right? And your body reacts. The adrenal glands produ produce the hormones that I talked about. Obviously, cortisol is important. Um, also, epinephrine, all of those things that give you that appropriate stress response. Unfortunately, when it reaches the CNS, which is your central nervous system, <clears throat> it's going to create that vicious circle again. So it's impacting amygdala, hippocampus, frontal cortex. This is all of the places that all of these behaviors that these kids have come from. Okay, When they're not getting the right input, they can't have the right output. Okay, So when we get up into the HPA axis, um, obviously a hypothalamus talks pituitary, adrenal glands, and more cortisol is let out. So we see it just keeps going sympathetic response over and over and over and over again. So a few of the things that can impact this, think about um, we have a lot of people that are doing in vitro fertilization. So we talk about this from a perspective of <clears throat> your body is not able to get pregnant for a reason, unfortunately. And it's a lot of times because the parent themselves is stuck in this circle, okay? But then we go in and we step in and we get them pregnant with two or three kids. <laughs> and then those two or three kids have to be born early Right? And as your body develops from, you know, little sperm and egg, um, your body's in sympathetic. So these little, these little forming fetuses are in a sympathetic response all the way up until just before they're born. So about 34 to 36 weeks is when their parasympathetic system starts to kick on. So when you have these children born premature, they're actually being born without having the formation of their parasympathetic system. So they're already behind <laughs> when they are born which is unfortunate. So these preterm deliveries actually can cause even more stress on a body that's already stressed from the beginning. We want to pump the brakes. Okay. And the biggest break for us is the vagus nerve. And we always say what happens in Vegas doesn't necessarily stay in Vegas. <laughs> because Vegas is the wandering nerve. It's Latin means wander. And it because it wanders through your whole body. It controls everything. If you look, it's basically controlling all these different systems. So when we're working on the upper cervical part of the body, and all of a sudden constipation starts clearing up, and their digestion starts getting better, and things start moving, it's actually because we're working on the vagus that wanders down into the intestines. Okay? And so this is all the different things. Vagus nerve is the brakes. It's how we bring back up the parasympathetics. And just like Ashley said, we don't want to slam on the brakes. We want to gently tap the brakes. Because a lot of these kids are beautiful, and I will say it's like you're a beautiful Ferrari going 90 miles down the road. And it's beautiful to watch. It's not that safe, but it's beautiful. We want to gently tap the brakes so they start slowing down. And that's what we do with the vagus nerve. And you can see all the different things it does, which is awesome. It's my favorite nerve. I love nerves, but this is my favorite one. So This is just another study that we did. Um, which is showing how important the vagus nerve is in creating homeostasis with the gut and the immune system. So it just gives us a lot more information about how these things are actually tying into what we're doing as chiropractors. By stimulating the vagus nerve, we're helping things like the gut, like the immune system, creating better homeostasis, which is balance. That's really what we're talking about. So unfortunately, like I said, you can't be in growth and protection at the same time. So Usually when we talk about autism or things like it, we consider it to be locked in. Um, unfortunately, these kids get hit from both sides, like we've just been talking. They aren't only on the gas all the time, but they're not even conscious of their break. And so that's where we come in. We need to unlock that. We need to unlock these kids and let them be restored and function at a higher level. Um, 
and happier lives, really. So the last D that we'll talk about before the disconnected part, this is about output. So dyspinesis defined as a reversible physiological state consisting of unnoticed misdirected neurophysical reactions to various agents. Pretty much what it's saying is when all of the things that we've talked about are all inputs, right? This is the output. And the output is really what we look at as chiropractors and that's what we are gonna do. We test to see exactly what's happening inside your kid's body or in your body for that matter, um, letting us know exactly what we need to do to help, okay? My favorite thing, we don't guess, we test. That's our saying in our office. So someone says, well, can you help this? We don't guess, we test. And we can let you know we have the, the most scientific, state-of-the-art equipment in our office that gives us a really, really good idea of what's going on with your child's spine and your spine, okay? Um, so we wanted to run through some case studies. So these are all case studies within the last month. Um, this is Drew. Drew came to us. He's 17 years old. Um, he actually came in with an ankle injury. Okay, no big deal, right? An ankle injury. Um, he's a sports guy, basketball, baseball, football. You know, looking at his history, he didn't have a whole lot of stuff, but he had a concussion when he was 15. He got hit in the face with a baseball. Um, but he's had multiple sprains. He's like constantly left ankle, right ankle, left ankle, right ankle, left ankle, right ankle. Um, and he had horrible posture. And this is what we're talking about with kids. They don't come in. You know, when we learned, you know, you put a book on your head and you're straight and you sit up straight. These kids are horrible posture. Um, do you think he might have something to do with proprioception? So I wanted to kind of run through his scans. So these are the scans we do. This is about a month ago. One of the scans, you can see all the black. When you see black, think bad. Black, bad. So, and then we look at this. This should be as close to the spine as possible. It should not have this jaggedy look. If it's in here, it's actually his neck is closed down. He's not even getting any proprioception, any nervous function to his neck. His number, and these are the what we'll, we do in our office, his number was 906. The average is 120 to 150 is what we're looking for. So he just came in for ankle, 906 total energy. So my analogy with that is, if I told you to squeeze your hands and squeeze them, and everybody just keep squeezing and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze, and just, you know what, keep doing that. Imagine that total energy. So rescan 12 visits later, about a month later. How beautiful does that look? Do you see any black? I mean, he's got a little bit still going on. He's still got a little bit in the neck, but he didn't even have neck issues, right? He came in with no symptoms. Look at this, how beautiful this is, right here. Still got a little bit in the neck, because the neck, the posture, but his posture is beautiful. And look at the number, 151. He basically said he's a lot calmer. Really? Can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> so Gabriel, seven years old, um, he came in with a lot of stuff going on. Um, lots of trouble in school, emotional mood swings, trouble listening, all of these things. Um, he never would sit still, and he is as skinny as a rail, right? <laughs> Tiny little kid could toss him around. He loves it, but he doesn't realize that it's because of a lot of other things. So his mom clearly did. That's why she brought him to us. So his scans, you can see, <laughs> he is just, all of his energy is all into, his, you can see the energy level there. He was at 1,300, okay? And... This scan lets us know just how the nerves are talking to the organs and everything. And you can see that there's a ton of stuff going on in there too. So black is bad and red is just almost as bad as black. So <laughs> we want to focus on those two. After only nine visits, they were going on vacation. Um, so his mom wanted to see how he was doing before they left. Uh, you can see he's not perfect by any means, but his number came down. His total energy number went from 1,300 all the way down to 460. It speaks for itself, right? You can tell how the numbers are so much better. So that's what we saw with him. Um, and he's, he's doing better in school now. He's able to focus. Um, his mom told me on the way to the office the other day, he did six sheets of homework, okay? Before he would be in the car, like just talking the whole time and not able to sit still and not able to focus. So that's pretty impressive for a seven-year-old as far as I'm concerned, right? So this is a perfect <coughs> storm in the making. Weston was six weeks old when he came into our office. He is the fourth baby. 
Um, she was induced one week early because he was going to be a big baby. Big baby. This is her fourth baby. I mean, come on. How big? 15 pounds, no problem, right? Um, he's 7 pounds, 15 ounces. That's not big, right? Not big at all, by any means. So from the get-go, she said he was bruised. His whole face was bruised. Um, she said that she had a fast delivery, but it was like a pile driver. He had colic from the get-go, and you'll see the testimonial that she says. And he was jaundiced for many weeks, not just one or two days, weeks is what she said, okay? So, perfect storm in the making. This is a scan. You can see how much black is going on, okay? Weston is so new, he doesn't even have a rescan. But this is the perfect storm in the making. So we want you to watch this video. Okay, my name is Amanda Wojcik. Um, this is Weston. <laughs> Say hi. And how old is Weston? Um, he's six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. All right. And then um, tell me where, uh, where you're coming from and how'd you hear about our office? Um, we come from Inlay City, so we drive about an hour. Okay. Um, I heard about the office from a friend of mine who brings her girls here. And um, I was talking to her about what was going on with him, and she just said, I really think you should try, you know, go see Dr. Saylor. Um, I really think you could help. And so I immediately came. Okay. Well, what's <laughs> going on with him? What is... um, basically, I would, someone else would call it colicky symptoms, mm -hmm. um, where he just screams constantly. Um, but he's my fourth baby, and I just wasn't accepting that he was just, Colicky and that it was a face. He seemed in pain constantly. Um, and there was nothing that we could do. Um, you know, he he would scream anytime you put him on his back, basically. We he when we changed his diaper, he screamed. And this is screaming like screaming, screaming, like not just fussy. Right. Screaming, um, uh, diaper changing. Anytime he's in the car seat, um, no length of time in the car would calm him. You know, he just mm -hmm. screamed. Um, holding him, we couldn't hold him, um, you know, like on his back, you couldn't hold him like this, um, he would scream, and um, he wouldn't sleep on his back, nothing. So um, we were constantly just bouncing and shooting, and we tried everything, gas drops and grape water and all the, everything, and he just constantly was screaming, in pain, obviously, to me. And so when my friend suggested to come here, um, I ran over. <laughs> And um, after meeting Dr. Saylor, I realized that his, um, I learned that based on, you know, the things that he did happened at birth, you know, we had Pitocin, so he had a really, um, he was bruised at birth, um, so he had a traumatic birth experience, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, he's sleepy. He wants to take a nap now. <laughs> All right. So um, how many times has he been adjusted now? He came, we came um, two days ago and was only adjusted once other than today. Okay. And his um, response was immediate. He, comp he, as soon as he was adjusted, he fell asleep, just kind of like dead weight, which he's never done before because he's always been really stiff. Mm -hmm. um, and so he slept really, really well. Um, and then it's been a couple days, and since then he's like a whole different baby. That's great. Um, no fussing, no crying, other than just when he's sleepy or hungry. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, all, everything's been resolved. You know, right. car driving, we drive an hour, and he screamed that we here on the first time. You know, he was perfectly quiet and happy and lots of smiles. Um, so we have our baby back. Oh, That's great. Right. Right. Well, welcome, we're happy you're here. Thank you. So, um, one adjustment. This was two days later, taped after it. So do you think we didn't stop a lot of different things? So let me kind of fill you in the backstory. So this was her fourth baby, right? She... Weston, she couldn't put Weston down. He screamed nonstop. The first time he came in, screamed the whole time he was in the office until after the adjustment. Um, she told me that her first child, who just turned 13, her oldest son, drives her more crazy than Weston does. Okay, think about that. So she, for six weeks, has been with this baby that screams nonstop, and you can't put, down, put, put the baby down, and her, the 13-year-old drives her more crazy. So how do you think the 13-year-old's birth was? Because this is her fourth baby. The first, middle two, great. So she proceeds to tell me her first child had extreme birth trauma. 
from the get-go that he came out so purple that her mom still says she has PSTD from it because she can see the baby. He was purple from bruising. Um, he had no symptoms of the toddler. Everything was great until he, he turned like three, she said. Now he has ADHD, severe anxiety, and learning disabilities. So when someone says, oh, it's possibly genetic, I look at this and say, okay, why one, not the two middle, and look at we just stopped with the fourth one. Because they had the same, basically same delivery, but Weston's was actually better than her, his oldest, older son, or oldest son. So how powerful is that? Like, what did we just stop? What do we just prevent? And it's, not, it's never too late, right? But this is why we wanted to show you this. So action steps. We want you to take away with what we're talking about and not just, yes, it's great information and great information is good to share. But our action steps are decrease the three T's. Increase the ability to adapt and also find out if we can help. Because we sure can. We are really good at this and we've been doing it for a really long time. Um, it's that simple. So our job basically is to see if we can help. So one of the things you might be asking like, well, as chiropractors, how do you adjust babies? How do you adjust kids? Is it scary? And we figured instead of us telling you, my daughter, my beautiful daughter, Brick, will give you a snapshot of what we do. Welcome to Van Avery Chiropractic. I'm Brick. This may be your first time, but don't be nervous. It's okay. I'm sure you've got some questions. Well, we're here to help. In this video, we're going to talk to some of Dr. Saylor's patients and their kids, just like me. The first question I have for you is, does chiropractic hurt? Um, when my back is hurting, KST helps it and it um, makes my back stop hurting. It tickles. It does? <laughs> when I get adjusted, it tickles. It kind of tickles a little bit. It doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. It tickles. It doesn't hurt at all. It just tickles a little bit. It makes me feel good. It feels like you're happy and getting healthy again. Does it hurt? No. Does it feel good? Yeah. How does the adjustment feel? Like light. It makes, but when you tap it, it, it feels a lot. It feels good. Is chiropractic scary? I'd say it's okay, it won't hurt. They have like a jungle room that you could probably go in and maybe they'll give you some toys to play with or something. This is one of the videos that we have our kids watch or your kids watch so they know it's not scary, that it's not coming just from mom or dad or us, but it's coming from other kids. And I swear I didn't realize how much it tickled until I watched this video because every <laughs> single kid said it tickled. I was like, oh wow, okay. <laughs> So we have one last video for you. I am part of a lost generation and I refuse to believe that I can change the world. I realize this may be a shock, but happiness comes from within is a lie and money will make me happy. So in 30 years, I will tell my children they are not the most important thing in my life. My employer will know that I have my priorities straight because work is more important than family. I tell you this, once upon a time, families stayed together. But this will not be true in my era. This is a quick fix society. Experts tell me 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. I do not concede that I will live in a country of my own making. In the future, environmental destruction will be the norm. No longer can it be said that my peers and I care about this earth. It will be evident that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It is foolish to presume that there is hope. And all of this will come true unless we choose to reverse it. There is hope. It is foolish to presume that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It will be evident that my peers and I care about this earth. No longer can it be said that environmental destruction will be the norm. In the future, I will live in a country of my own making. I do not concede that 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. Experts tell me this is a quick fix society, but this will not be true in my era. Families stayed together once upon a time. I tell you this. Family is more important than work. I have my priorities straight because my employer will know that they are not the most important thing in my life. So in 30 years, I will tell my children, money will make me happy is a lie, and true happiness comes from within. I realize this may be a shock, but I can change the world, and I refuse to believe that I am part of a lost generation. So we just wanted to say there is hope. 
looking at things in a different way. And you know, you read it one way and then you read it another. So there's options and hope and that's what we're here to share with you guys today.